This is Fearless Leadership with Brendan Keegan, a production of Forbes Books, conversations with leaders who provide valuable, candid insights from their journeys and share their secrets to what made them successful and fearless. This week's fearless leader is the phenomenal Sasha DeJulian. At just 35 years old, she is without question the most decorated and best female climber on the planet. She's traveled to over 50 countries, competing over 30 first ascents along the way. It's no exaggeration whatsoever to say that Sasha has almost single-handedly brought rock climbing into the mainstream. Now, through her jaw-dropping climbs and poise, she's inspired countless people around the world to embrace the sport. She's also author of Take the Lead, Hanging On, Letting Go, and Conquering Life's Hardest Climbs. So, Sasha, welcome to the podcast, and, and clearly, you are fearless. Thanks so much for having me. Um, slight adjustment. I'm 30, not 35, but I'll take the extra five years of wisdom. All right. Well, hey, how about that? So you got all that done in 30 years, not 35. Even even your your ascent is even faster. <laughs> Working so, on it. So so let's get started. So you started climbing at an incredible at a young age. And what drew you to the sport? And how old were you when you started climbing? Yeah, I started climbing when I was six years old. So six. I grew up in the Washington, DC area. Northern Virginia. And my brother had a birthday party. He was turning eight and I was six. And it was like his hockey team and school friends and then his little sister. And there was something about the sport that just really stuck to me at that birthday party. And it was a very non-traditional way to get into climbing at the time. Like climbing was a very new sport, very unknown. Um, climbing gyms even were in just like random warehouses around the country, not nearly as popular as it is yeah. today. Um, but there was something about that birthday party that there was just like, I really liked being in control of my progression to the top of the wall. And the gym employee was like, to my mom, hey, your daughter's really good at this. She should join our junior team program. I'm sure she said that to like all of the parents, but it stuck with me. And I was dabbling with a lot of sports at the time, namely ballet and figure skating. But I did like been skiing since I was three, played house soccer, like all the kind of like traditional sports. Um, and I joined the junior team. So going like Wednesdays and Saturday mornings. And one Saturday morning when I was seven, I walked in and the gym was closed and it was buzzing with all these kids from the tri-state area who were competing in a youth regional championship. And that's how I found out, like literally stumbled upon the competitive realm of climbing being more of a sport than just a hobby. And I competed in the 11 and under category, won my category. I was seven. It was my first competition ever. And so many less kids than there are today, to be <laughs> fair. Um, but that was kind of what started my trajectory on like the plastic climbing side, which is where I spent the first decade and a half of my career was like cutting my teeth and winning major competitions. So your, your brother's birthday party in Northern Virginia, so you just went to a gym and, and that was, that was pretty neat. Like as your parents were just looking for something, do we take them bowling? Do we take them to play dodgeball or something? And, and they took you to, to a climbing gym and, and, uh, Somebody there spotted talent in, in six year six year old Sasha. Yeah, no, literally a friend recently said, "What if the birthday party was a bowling party?" Uh, <laughs> you could we, we professional bowling fun. tour here, Fully. or, or yeah. cornhole. You could you could be like professional cornhole tosser. So now, does your brother claim any of your success that he's he kind of got you started because of the birthday party? I will bug him about it a little bit. My brother is like, it was, he was always like the incredible athlete in hockey and football and more traditional sports. Sure. And, um, my, my side was, um, yeah, I, I think that I was just very competitive with my older brother. And so finding something that I was naturally more inclined to be better than him at, I think definitely catalyzed my interest in the sport. That's awesome. 
So kind of going from climbing and, and you're thinking like what leadership qualities, you know, we talk about fearless leadership on this podcast, what leadership qualities or mindset do you think have enabled you to be successful and have such a rapid rise in this sport? Climbing and leadership really go hand in hand. There's a lot of parallels actually. So on the individual level, when you're charting out a climb, you need to do a lot of mitigation of what risk is in front of you and how you can control the certain variables, what you can control, what you can't control, what your plan A to C is of contingency plans when things go wrong, because they always will. They'll always go different than you anticipate. In goal setting, there's a lot of visualization and you know, you, you have this big climb ahead of you, but you can't climb 3000 feet in, you know, the first instance, so you have to start breaking it down into what steps are necessary to achieve that overall success on the wall. So it's really comes down to what individual movement and then solving those individual sequences starts knitting together the overall puzzle piece. Um, but when it, you get into what I do now is big expeditions and free climbing big walls around the world, I'm putting together these teams to go after these major objectives. And we may be like camping for five weeks at a time. So we're really setting aside like this is what we're going to eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner. Um, this is the gear that we need. There's a lot of minutia that goes into planning a bigger expedition and then gathering the right team, like setting intentions, having transparent communication around, you know, what I want to achieve on the wall versus what my partner wants to achieve, what we'll do if that's not happening, weather contingency plans and everything around that. So I could go on um, probably for a while over the different layers of where um, leadership skills and rock climbing really cross over. No, I like a couple of your comments on controllables and non-controllables. I, I, I just, before this podcast got out of a leadership meeting and actually talked about, talked about that. Now talked about it in terms of a P and L, you know, what, what, what cost do you control? What don't you control? So it's interesting you use that term. And then, uh, I like how you talked about breaking, breaking big climbs into, into small pieces. And that, you know, if, if, uh, if, if someone has a big goal for their career personally, or they have a big goal for their company and it just looks so big, it almost can look impossible or unachievable, but breaking that, that down as you break down, you know, the, the big climbs, I, I love that. So, so now in your intro, I talked about you, you've, you've traveled to over 50 countries for climbing. Do you have a favorite place that you've climbed in the world or a favorite mountain or any, anything you can tell us, you've been to 50 different countries. What, what's, uh, what's exciting. That's a really hard question to answer. Um, one of my most memorable trips was actually to Madagascar to climb in the Sonaro region there. I do outline in my book, my experience of having malaria on the wall. So that, uh, was maybe partially why it was so memorable, but malaria aside, it's just a really beautiful region of the world that I can't imagine ever having gotten to go experience were it not for climbing, taking me there. Um, I traveled to rural parts of Indonesia where I was developing rock climbing as a sustainable alternative within the ecotourism space. And that zone was really beautiful. I, I went deep water soloing, which is essentially climbing without a rope up to basically like 50 feet above water on these limestone cliff bands in this place called Sumba, which is in Indonesia. Um, in the US, like Yosemite is one that comes to mind. Uh, the Red River Gorge in Kentucky, for those of you who are surprised that climbing actually is very prevalent in Slade County, Kentucky, but it's another example of climbing really transforming an economy. And that's because it's like this major outdoor recreation activity that's brought a lot of people internationally to this otherwise economically depressed region of the U.S. Excellent. Okay. So we talked about your favorite. Now let's talk about your hardest climb. What's, what's the hardest climb you've ever, ever completed? And can you describe what that experience was like to us? Yeah, I, I think that um, each adventure that I've gone on 
has provided its own, um, I guess, like toss up, whether it was the hardest. But most recently, last fall, I went on this big expedition where I was the lead and I put together a team of other female climbers and I wanted to go and attempt the hardest wall ever been done by a female team. I had set the record of the hardest um, graded wall done by a woman before. And this was kind of my comeback after a major setback and injury. I had a double hip reconstruction surgery where I was um, under the knife, so to speak, for two years over the course of five surgeries where my hips were completely cut apart, my abs cut through and reconstructed. My femur head was essentially popping out of the pelvic bone structure. Hmm. And I was told I may never be able to climb professionally again. And so I went into that experience so full of so many unknowns. Um, and I took off, it was like six months completely from exercise in that whole process. And it was a really challenging time for me in my life, just mentally as well, being so sidelined. And so going on this expedition um, to go in like, try and reach this summit of this climb was full. I think mentally of all of its hurdles, like I had a panic attack going the night before going in because I was like so nervous that I wasn't ready and that I was leading this team into all of these dangerous, uncontrollable variables. The last expedition I had planned, someone had had this tragic accident and actually died on. Um, and so that mentally, I look to our achievement there. It was over the course of a month. We actually did reach the summit. We free climbed the um, mountain in Picos de Europa. And it was like this extreme victory. But it was probably mentally one of the most challenging climbs that I've had because it was the first time that I was really getting back on the saddle, so to speak. Um, and pushing myself on terrain that I had once accomplished, but wasn't sure if I could do again and setting this new historical, um, yeah, boundary to be, to be surpassed for women. So, so you, you had these surgeries two years, you didn't, you didn't do anything physical for six months. So how do you meant, you talked about the mental side, how do you mentally prepare for, for a climb and how do you mentally overcome the obstacle that you had of, of surgery and of people telling you what you couldn't do and you saying you're focusing on what you can do. So talk to me about the mental side of that. How, how do you do that? Yeah, it's, it's similar to controlling what you can control. So when I was looking down the barrel of five surgeries and learning how to walk again three times after just going through these massive um, operations, it was, I can't train like I normally do. Um, but what I can't control is showing up to PT, controlling my nutrition, educating myself around how to optimize my body's ability to recover. So that's where I really surrounded myself by a team of professionals who knew more than me about ways in which I could be approaching my nutrition as well as my PT and everything kind of around what I could do and then relinquishing like that need to control of what you can't actually control. And so it is in many ways similar to climbing and similar to business. And it actually was the backbone of why I started my business, which is a nutrition bar company, because I learned so much about how the human, if optimally fueled with the right ingredients, can actually physically knit itself back together and accomplish this recovery. All right. So let's get a plug in for your nutrition bar company. Tell me more about that. Yeah. I, I always made my own bars because when you're climbing, you're out like in Madagascar, in Indonesia, in like random areas of, um, you know, Asia or Europe where you don't have access to fresh greens and fresh real food. So I always made my bars in my blender. Even when I was a freshman at Columbia, I had like my uh, blender and I would throw nuts and dates and seeds and vegetable powders and blend them up and send them to my different friends on expeditions. 
And it was my way of not eating the crap that was on the market because it's so full of preservatives and sugar and chemicals. Um, I actually registered the name send bars. Send in climbing means doing something optimally, like achieving um, your optimal performance. And in 2012, I was super busy. I was like balancing my professional career of climbing with going to Columbia and being a full-time student. So I just kind of sat on it and kept refining my recipes, learning more about nutrition. And then during my surgeries um, and my time off from climbing, that was when I started digging in and, and building my team and filling it with, you know, my voids with people that know better than me within those certain domains. And we're an all female team based out of Boulder. Awesome. Okay. So you talked about preparing mentally and then you talked about having to train. What does your training regimen look like when you're preparing for a big climb? My training really uh, depends on the season. So I'll do outdoor specific training, which is having exposure to climbing outside since that's a big practice point. It's like going hiking up to climbs, which is why I do live in Boulder, Colorado, because we have so much of our natural playground in our backyard um, and spending the day out climbing. But then on training days, like that's like the really fun sports specific training. Um, I actually completely gutted my garage and, and excavated down. So I wouldn't need to get like a permit to raise my roof, but built a training center in my garage where I have what's called a tread wall, which you can climb like 3000 feet without leaving the ground, um, above like a two feet because it's basically like a treadmill, but vertical. And then I have different systems boards, which are connected to led technology. So there's like thousands of different climbs that connect to this 12 foot by 14 foot wall. And the holds light up given the different path that's like on this app. So I have two systems boards like that. There's a lot of um, kind of climbing specific drills that I'll do um, on those boards. Climbing, you actually are developing your finger strength a lot. So hanging off of like, you have like the front pad of your finger is actually would be like a very large climbing hold in comparison to what I do. If you were to like look at the top quarter of your fingertip, that's more of what you're hanging on to. So I'll be hanging from that with added weight and doing pull-ups and stuff like that to increase my strength to um, capacity ability to like be hanging literally off my fingertips. I, I do lifting as cross training and I do cardio about six days a week. I actually just signed up for my first Ironman because I'm, I just like it. Um, I like to swim a lot for cross training and biking are like two big things for me. So yeah, yeah, just pass. signed up for an Ironman. No big deal. I was bored. Just that just rip one of these out. I, oh my God. I, I'm, I'm thinking like the, I'm like thinking like hanging on this, this, this part. And you say the quarter of that. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm also scared of heights. So like, I'm like the last guy to be, you are not picking me to be on your next climb. I'll, I'll share that with you. Now you might pick me to be on other teams, but so, hey, so your garage, do you ever say you're going out to the mountain or do you say I'm going out to the garage? Just like, depends. Cause I, I do go out to the mountain yeah. or I'll say, I'm, I actually call my garage, the digi dojo. The, um, I was gonna say, you can't call it a garage when you got a, you got a 3000 foot climbing wall in your garage. You got to call it something else. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's what, what, let's let's change the conversation a little bit. You're you're a pioneer for for women. You're just like like women look up to you that have no interest in climbing, just have interest in powerful women, just women that are successful. Um, but what barriers have you had to overcome? Oh man, <laughs> a lot. Um, climbing. So first of all, for women, like. Climbing is by nature, in some regards, a subjective sport in the way that we have a grade scale that basically dictates like how hard a certain climb out in nature is. And I think that women routinely, and myself included, have gone through, um, first of all, it's a sport where the delta between male and female performance is actually quite small comparatively to other sports because your body is essentially what's enabling your progression up the wall. And so if you're a small female versus a larger male, you just adapt a different climbing style. And I think that because of that notion, 
it breeds insecurity in the female experience and climbing versus the male experience. So for my career, I've constantly felt like the need to prove myself against the, the, um, friction of maybe a male being insecure of me having a successful career and having corporate mainstream attention is new within the parameters of climbing. Like, um, I was the first really of my, uh, generation at least to be cutting against the grain and signing with big corporations like Adidas and Red Bull. Um, and, and that was different to the roots of what climbing as a sport with the kind of dirt bag history to it looked like, like so much of it is going out and, um, achieving these climbs, but just with your buddy. And maybe you're like, you know, in your van eating cans of tuna and just trying to get by with like granola bars. But I never really saw, first of all, I never really saw climbing as this like avenue I want to pursue as a professional sport because my parents were like very adamant that I had to get straight A's at school. And if I didn't, then I couldn't go to climbing. And if I did, then I could, you know, carry on Miss Friday because I had to fly to France to compete or whatever it was. Um, So from a young age, like I think that my upbringing um, and even the dynamic that I had with my dad was very much like, you're not going to go down this trope of the traditional climber and drop out and not go to college because you're pursuing this sport. That wasn't ever something that I really saw as like part of my journey, just because it wasn't an option for me. Um, And because of that, I always felt this need to um, do well, both in climbing and in these other aspects of my life. But tracing back to like the female experience as I was having the success and getting media attention and signing with big corporate sponsors, um, I think I faced a lot of insecurity and jealousy and people trying to knock me down and, and even like saying that things that I was doing weren't necessarily as hard as they were, even by people who hadn't even done them. Um, and I, I think that the, the through line is just, there's always haters. There's always people when you're succeeding at something to shake you down and try and say, you know, what you're doing isn't necessarily like legit enough or hard enough or whatever it is. Um, and so I've, I think that my main parameter has always been to show up and work really hard and do my best. Yeah. You just hit on something that unfortunately uh, happens in the world, whether it's envy or whatever, but when, when someone gets to the summit, you know, just to use that as a little parallel, whether it's an athlete or uh, an executive or heck uh, a parent in the PTO, there just seems to be this societal want to want to pull them down. And, and I can only imagine how, how you face that. So let's talk about your production company. You, you started a production company, female focused adventures uh, to empower women in outdoor sports. Can you tell us about this project and, and how, how you were inspired to do it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, my production company is very small, but it has a big vision. It's going to yeah. be big. It's going to be big. Yeah. My, I mean, my hope for it is, was the, the first thing was you don't as an athlete have the control and ability to tell your story from your own narrative. And that was a big part of, you know, writing the book was owning my own story. And there's always going to be people around that will tell your story for you. But when you're working with a crew and you're creating a film, you don't actually, as the athlete or the talent, have the control over how that message is conveyed. And in the editing room or in the media, like you're in the green room, people can say whatever they want. And the same thing could be edited in like five different ways to come out with five different end results. And the main thing that I wanted was to be able to have more control over my own story. Mm-hmm. And so that was the the initial emphasis was I had frankly gone through a bad breakup with someone who I used to climb with a lot. I went on this big climbing trip that was the goal was to climb three of the hardest um, 514 walls in the Canadian Rockies. And I went off 
alone. And the whole like production plan of it was pretty shattered and all over the place because I all of a sudden didn't have like my former partner wasn't a partner, but also it was like very convoluted because he was my climbing partner too. And who I was going to go do these walls with. Um, so that was when I was like, I'm just going to try and capture it myself and hire people to come with me and then knit together this film around, um, whatever happens happens. And so that was kind of the initial exposure to really owning my own content and creating my own story. It was ended up being a film called the trilogy and it was very, um, kind of homemade, so to speak, but ended up winning the People's Choice Award at the Banff Mountain Film Festival, where it premiered. Um, and following that, I felt really empowered by the experience of leading my own expedition, being like that main character driving, especially as it kind of had this history of like doing a bunch of climbs with male climbing partners and always doing the same amount of work and the same amount of success but my success being attributed to the presence of a male being there and almost like this assumption mm -hmm. that because he was a part of it, I did less. Um, so I was like, it'd be amazing to start leading female expeditions where there's no like male mm -hmm. to attribute our success to. And I can hire as many as I can, like females within the industry to be the content creators to and behind the lens as well as in front of the lens. And that's kind of like, I guess, the microscopic version of like the origin story of it. But what my dream for it is, is to have more funding and ability to give a grant, say, to other female teams that are completely isolated from me being involved and just have a platform to be able to tell more female stories in the adventure space. Because so many of the stories we see are male stories. And there's so many women out there doing like incredible feats that I think as a woman, that's where I relate. Like I'm really inspired by when other women really push the boundary in sport because it's something that I can see myself um, doing more so than someone who's totally like physiologically built differently than me. That's, that's, that's just fantastic. I got so many, so many more thoughts to go on that one, but here's a topic I, I want to hit with you. So, you're a leader, you're a role model, you're, you're a business person, you're an entrepreneur. Um, how do you handle the pressure and expectation that sponsors put on you, media put on you, fans put on you? And, and I'm just from talking to you, I think you probably put on you. Um, you know, what's your approach to staying focused? So you got these goals, you got these goals as a climber, you have these goals as, as an entrepreneur, you have this goal as as a, a female role model, how do you handle all the pressure and expectations and how, what do you, how do you handle all that? Yeah, it's hard. I would say that the hardest thing is the intrinsic pressures because I always feel like my fear is not applying myself enough and not having like, I don't want to look back with the regret on not having worked hard enough to explore and have that curiosity of what my potential is. Um, I think that the main way that I cope is having mechanisms to de-stress. And that's, you know, through breath work, through visualization, which I do a lot of visualization within climbing, but also knowing the outlets by which like I can relax my mind, like after a long day, I'm a big bath person. Like I like to decompress. Um, but also we live in such a weird, like connected, but disconnected, um, I guess, like dynamic with people because of online and because you have so many digital conversations, but the people in your presence are where you, I actually find my fulfillment. So surrounding myself by my friend group that I like choose whose opinions even matter to me is where I feel like I can actually relax my mind too. It's like, there's just so much value in being with positive people who don't always need to be hype people. Like I actually don't want that out of my friends. Like I want them to just be super real, but having, you know, dinners with friends and going and doing things outside, like walking my dog on the trail. That's a big part of my mental health. Um, even starting the day is like, 
I had to train myself out of looking at my phone first thing in the morning. Like the first thing in the morning that I do is go and, um, you know, make a smoothie and go out onto the trail with my dog because not allowing other like riffraff of expectation Mm -hmm. or people's opinions to kind of like percolate into your mindset when you first wake up and before you fall asleep is uh, it's been an important thing for me to start to realize because there's always going to be that internal pressure, but how do you kind of balance like other people's perception and expectation over you as having a strong mindset internally? I, I like that last part. So kind of like start your day with no influence. So you're yeah. not, you're not getting a, a, a text. You're not seeing uh, something on Instagram. You're not seeing a news flash. Kind of like that. Start your day with no with, with no influence and, and set your day. So, okay. So a couple last question. Do you have any climbs or projects that you got planned for, for the rest of this year and 24? What, what, what's on the horizon? What, what can we expect from you? Yeah, actually, um, last week I just completed a new first ascent here in Boulder, Colorado with a woman named Lynn Hill. And it was this route that we developed on a feature called the Maiden, um, which is this big, like 300 foot flat iron spire. Um, And we called it the Queen Line. And I'll be in Yosemite in November working on a project on El Cap. Um, Mm. I have been filming this documentary that will come out next year. Um, And let's see, uh, those are like the immediate things. Uh, I always like to set my intentions with training over like having smart goals, like things that really keep me on track to my larger goals, but are more small and achievable. So I have climbs like that throughout the front range that I'm working on and that keep me accountable in training, even with signing up for like races, because I like to just have something that I'm training for always, because it kind of like fuels my, um, it fuels it feels training from being too boring when you have an objective that you're going after. And I think that that's very universal. You know, like a lot of my friends aren't athletes, like they aren't professional athletes, so to speak, but they are signed up for a half marathon or something like that because it gets you out the door. And I think that those goals are important too. Um, So alongside this bigger goal that I have in Yosemite and also um, in yeah, a, a place that's TBD for end of next year. That would be a really big expedition. Stay tuned. All right. Hey, so uh, if, if people that are listening to this want to get to know more about you and follow you, uh, buy some of your bars, uh, see you upcoming, um, follow your, 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 your career, your next, how, 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 can, how can they learn about you and stay in touch with you? Can you give us some, uh, can you point us in some direction? Yeah, my social account is just my name. So across Instagram and TikTok and Threads and X, um, it's Sasha D. Julian. Um, and then for Send Bars, it's just Send Bars, like S E N D B A R S. Um, we have a website, sendbars.com. We're on Amazon too, and 50 retail specialty locations around the country. But the best is online. Uh, we're, we're about a year old at this point, And um, we're super scrappy three person team, myself included. And it's been really fun to, you know, transfer that business parameter from sport into business parameters of the CPG industry. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, well, everyone today, we have had the great pleasure and learning experience. I've got a page of notes here. Um, everything from controllable and not controllable to visualization, breaking big climbs down into small, small parts. I love the starting your day with no influence, just like not looking at that phone and letting your mind kind of like go away from your goals or just go, go on to others. Uh, the intrinsic pressures, that was another one you talked about. So, uh, today has been great, Sasha. Thanks so much, uh, to the, to the crew listening. Uh, this is the one and only phenomenal Sasha DeJulian, who's 30 years old. And she, by the way, she started Send in her dorm room at when she was 19, I heard, when she was mixing up things in her blender there because she didn't want to, uh, in New York City, go go get uh, stuff that had processed. Uh, I- incredible climbs, moving uh, females forward and doing incredible things. 
on the wall and off the wall. Literally, ladies and gentlemen, a rock star. Thank you, Sasha, for being with us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed it and appreciate it. This has been Fearless Leadership with Brendan Keegan. If you want to learn to live and lead fearlessly, go to brendanpkeegan.com. Fearless Leadership is a production of Forbes Books.